Hello everyone, welcome to Roman Just Codes. I am Roman, and in this episode and last episode of the series, I'll continue building our Flicky Home Automation app. This time, I'll wrap it up by building responsiveness into my Flutter app so I can load it on both phones and tablets, and it can be displayed accordingly while leveraging the real estate available on each of these form factors. Make sure to catch the previous videos in the series so you can catch up, or grab the link to the repo from the description for the full project. Let's proceed. So this is what the application looks like if you try to run it as is. Not very appealing. A bunch of warning bands, not taking advantage of the extra space on the tablet. More like a stretched out phone version. I mean, most of it works, but your users expect a certain user experience depending on the device they're loading the app. Enter responsive apps in Flutter. Typically, a responsive app is one that has its layout tuned for the available screen size. Often this means, for example, relaying out the UI if the user resizes the window or changes the device's orientation. This is especially necessary when the same app can run on a variety of devices, from a watch, phone, tablet, to a laptop or desktop computer. In my case, I want the corresponding user experience regardless of whether I load the same app on a phone or a tablet so it is responsive to the available screen size. Someone once asked me, is responsiveness in Flutter just a bunch of if-elses scattered throughout my app? Well, if you want it to be, then yes, but I'll show you where and when it is applicable as well as a more systematic way of approaching responsiveness in Flutter while keeping your UI logic pristine and leveraging Flutter's declarative nature. The way you approach it is as follows. You may have the designs that correspond to each form factor, for example, a tablet version and a phone version. Notice how they both have slight differences in which they lay out the items. Navbar in mobile is horizontal, while on tablet is vertical. Header and quick actions are laid out vertical on mobile, while on tablet they look horizontal. The energy consumption bar stretches along the bottom, taking most of the screen's real estate. See how we implemented a master detail approach when viewing a device's details on the tablet, while on mobile, we navigate to a separate page. Now it's just a matter of collecting the values and properties that activate these layouts at these breakpoints, phone and tablet in our case. For example, I'll capture a property called bottom bar direction, that when I've detected that I'm on a mobile device, its value will be horizontal and vertical otherwise. I'll have another property called content direction. This is for the top portion of the home page that on mobile is vertical, but on tablet is horizontal, and so on and so forth. I'll capture these flags and properties in a central location, a configuration class of some sort, depending on the current device layout. I'll feed this configuration class to my UI and the UI will consume it, rendering its widgets according to the values set in the config class. This is responsiveness in a nutshell. Now on to the implementation. Let's start with the landing page, of course. First, start by creating a subfolder called Responsiveness under your Features Presentation folder. Now create the configuration class that will consolidate the properties that will change depending on the breakpoints triggered by your device's screen type. I'll call it Landing Page Responsive Config. Define the properties that your UI will require to adjust the layout depending on the device's screen type. For example, bottom bar direction type axis, so I can do either vertical or horizontal. The same for content direction, whether I want the content to be reversed or not, how I want the color of my bottom bar, the amount of flex that I want the header portion to occupy, the direction of the top portion, as well as whether I want to display things or not on my screen, so I have a flag called show bold on header. I'll use a package called Responsive Builder, which gives you handy widgets that help you in building responsive UIs and contains cool utility methods that return you the value that you give it for the device screen you're viewing the app on. Check it out. I'll create a static method that takes a build context and spits out the corresponding instance of my newly created config class depending on the device's screen. I'll populate an instance of the config class per device type with their appropriate values. Then, all we do is query its static utility method passing the widget's context, and we get the corresponding config class for our device type. Let's work on the bottom bar widget. Now, 
just use this config class like any other class, consuming the values provided and plugging them where needed. Remember how I've been using flex widgets instead of columns and rows in certain spots? Well, because of this. Now, depending on the device's type, this flex widget will render according to my configuration without any extra special if-else logic or crazy convoluted logic polluting my UI. Let's launch the app on the tablet and start seeing things. Okay, we're not quite there yet. Let's continue working on the landing pages layout. We'll use the same config class since I've captured properties for all landing pages aspects. Let me add a center widget around my main layout. Replace the hard-coded direction in the existing flex and apply both direction and vertical direction from the config class. I'll have to revert the order of items on this flex and that's why I'll create a handy extension method for it right here. This extension method will just reverse the order of any list of widgets. We'll tack on the extension method to the flex row widget list and trigger it only if the config class has the reverse content flag set to true. And there it is. For tablets, the bottom navigation bar becomes a vertical navigation bar, as expected. Now, let's work on the contents of the homepage widget, where we have the header, quick actions, and the energy consumption chart. For the sake of time, I've added the properties to implement responsiveness on this page to the same landing page config, but you should create a separate config class per page for better management and decoupleness. We'll consume some of the properties from the config class, such as the home top part flex, which defines how much space the top part takes in regards to the rest of the page, as well as the direction in which we want to lay out our widgets in the top portion of this page, using the home top direction property. Let's wrap the home page header widget inside an expanded widget, so then we can distribute its space accordingly and also define how much space it takes using the home header flex property. Wrap the home tile options panel widget inside an expanded widget as well, that way both widgets distribute the real estate available among them. Things are looking much better. Now, for tablets, I want to show a bit more content. I want to show the bolt animation next to the header only for tablets, so I'll use one of my flicky animated icons and use that show bolt on header flag to drive this logic, thanks also to a visibility widget. Nice, things are definitely taking shape. Look, the same code on both devices, and each one renders and lays out its widgets slightly different based on the real estate available. Not a bunch of if-elses, no polluted or convoluted UI, pure beauty, and a clean implementation. Let's continue. Now, let's tackle the display of the device details. For tablets, we want to show a master detail layout, while on phones we want to perform a page navigation so we can better utilize the available screen space. How do you do it, you ask? Let me show you. In our devices feature folder, add another subfolder called responsiveness and follow the same approach. Create a config class and call it device details responsive config and capture the properties to drive the layout based on device type. I'll capture the details icon size, whether to show it as a single layout or not, and the border radius on the add device form, which I'll show you later how we'll make it show as a dialogue for tablets and a bottom sheet for mobile. Go to the Devices page and query its corresponding configuration. Wrap the existing expanded below the main page header inside a visibility widget and feed to the visible property the config show single layout flag. When we want to display the single layout for mobile, we will only show the list and nothing else. 
we will leverage this additional property of the visibility widget called replacement, which does nothing but render an alternate widget if the visible property is false, and does exactly what it says, shows a widget as a replacement of the visible widget. The replacement widget will simply contain the two column layout for tablets. Here, again, I avoid having if-else clauses and keeping my UI logic clean and straightforward. I'll create the two column layout inside a builder so it has its own context, or I could just easily extract it as a completely separate widget. Your call. We'll start by adding a row that puts both devices list and device details panels side by side, sharing the available space, hence nested inside expanded widgets. This is what it should look like afterwards. Whoops, it is still navigating when I tap on one of the list items. Let's prevent that and do the navigation approach only when it's mobile. We'll handle that in the logic instead of the UI. Go to the devices list view model and notice how in the show device details we are navigating regardless. Let's fix this. In my utils class, I'll create a simple utility method called isMobile and all it will do is return me a flag whether we are in a mobile screen or not. We'll leverage this logic later in other places. We're using the same responsive builder package to get the corresponding device type and checking whether the size of the screen matches that of a mobile screen. Back in my show device details method, just surround the navigation call with a check on the isMobileUtility method, and voila, we'll still mark the device as selected but without navigating for the case of tablets. While I'm at it, I'll also do it on the remove device functionality. So instead of popping the pushed screen, we'll first do the corresponding check. Very cool. Before we go any further, let's do some minor adjustments to the device details panel to improve on how the content fits in its designated region. In the devices page, let's extract the main header as a widget that may change its position depending on the device's screen. We'll proceed to lay out both the devices list and the header in a single column left aligned where the device list occupies most of the space. Looking good. Test the removal of the device, working as expected. Do the proper cleanup and retest. Let's go ahead and retest on the phone to check that we haven't messed things up. Yup, our single layout column should be left aligned, so let's fix that. Good. And also good. Looks great on both devices, y'all. Moving on to the add device functionality, which as you may recall, it is a widget that shows on a bottom sheet. Sure, on a tablet it works, but this is literally a stretched out version of the phone implementation, which makes us look lazy and that we didn't give it the required treatment. Let's change that perception. In the utils class, let's go to our existing show UI model utility method and do some refactoring. If you see, we are triggering this function from the home tile options view model class. We could handle it here, but I'd rather encapsulate it much further to keep changes transparent to whoever triggers it. What we will do is check the isMobileUtility method created earlier, and if true, sure, we'll show a bottom sheet. But if not, we'll instead show it as a dialog, using the show dialog method available in the material library in a modal fashion, passing exactly the same content to it, but adjusting it for better viewing on a tablet. Here, I'm giving it the fractionally sized box treatment to it, setting the width factor to be half the screen's width, and the height factor an 80% of the screen's height.
I'll go ahead and wrap the contents of my add device sheet widget inside a material widget as it is expected to have a material based widget at the root. Reload and check. On tablet, it should look like a modal dialog, while as on mobile, it should look like a bottom sheet. Everything working as expected. Let's flip both to dark mode and see how things look on the dark side. Wow, couldn't be more impressed on how we came out. Loading this on both tablets and phones and deploying this solution around my house is going to be the talking point at my next house gathering. And I can brag to my friends about how thanks to Flutter, my life is easier and my home more modern. So thank you, Flutter. And that's it. This is my way of showing you what's possible in Flutter and hopefully this provides some inspiration and helps you in your decision whether to pick Flutter for your next project. I showed you my approach on how I created this simple yet scalable and robust home automation system and a handful of connected devices that I can send commands to. Of course, there's lots of improvements in this project. So take this project's code, check out the GitHub repo in the description and make it your own and take it much further. Make sure to get the right equipment so you can make your execution flawless. I'll continue expanding on this project to add capabilities such as adding rooms, whether their devices are indoors or outdoors, the sky is the limit. This has been another episode of Roman Just Code touching on the world of Flutter. I'm Roman, see you on the next one. Hey there, I am Roman from Roman Just Codes. I hope that you found the content of this video very useful. And if you did, make sure to like it and subscribe to this channel. You know subscribing to this channel is free, right? Thank you so much for watching.